So in this next module, we're going to talk about the discussion section of your manuscript. In the discussion section, in terms of the writing, it really gives you the most freedom of any of the other written sections. So it gives you the most chance to put your good writing on display, all the things that we've been talking about in this course. Of course, since there's so much flexibility, it actually is the most challenging to write. But challenging in a good way, because it's really going to get you to really practice your writing skills. So follow all the good rules, the rules for good writing that we've been talking about in this class. And in the discussion section, you kind of remember we had that cone in the introduction section, you're kind of inverting that cone. So where you left off in the introduction section was with the specific question that you were trying to answer, or the specific hypothesis that you were trying to test in your study. So you start the discussion section by saying what happened by answering the, that question, by answering that hypothesis. So you asked a question in the introduction section, you answer it right at the beginning of the discussion section. We found that is the most common way to start that discussion section. Then you're going to, you've given what you think you're, the answer to that question is based on your data, then you're going to support that conclusion with your data and other people's data from the literature. So give all the lines of evidence, see, say how your results fit in in the context of the literature. Then you're going to defend your conclusions. So this is the limitation section, the, the obligatory limitation section of your discussion section. You want to anticipate the criticisms that people might have, the reasons that they might disagree with your conclusions, and defend your conclusions. And then at the end, you're going to go broad. So now you're getting to something, you're, you started with something specific, now you're going to something very general. You want to give the big picture what are the big implications of your research? This is where you want to give implications, recommendations, give the big picture take-home message. Give your clear take-home message. So in other words, the discussion to tell you what do my results mean and why should anyone care? And that's a very important point. A lot of times people will you know, spend a lot of time saying what the results mean, but they spend too little time saying why those results are important. That means if somebody that's outside your immediate little niche area in science goes to read your paper, they're not going to know why they should care. you got to make them care. So here's one kind of way of organizing the discussion. Here's kind of the elements that most discussion sections will contain. And of course, again, it's a little bit discipline specific exactly what goes in that discussion, but these I, I'm giving you a fairly general kind of picture here. So again, you want to start the discussion section with something like, we found that, and then you answer the question that you ended with in the introduction section, what you, your aim was or what your hypothesis was. What did you find relative to that hypothesis? You're going to explain what the data mean at that very high level. Give the big picture of what do my results mean. You want to clearly and explicitly state if the findings are novel. You want to point that out for your readers. You may also have some key secondary findings. Oftentimes we, you know, we do a study to, to find one thing and we find some other interesting findings uh, in the process. So then you might state those other key secondary findings. So you're going to give your findings and then you're going to put all of that in context. So this means here's where you can get to some detail that I didn't want you to put into your, into your introduction section. So you can give possible mechanisms or pathways that might explain something that you're seeing in your data. Go down, you know, one level in the biology, for example. If you're looking at people, you might talk about the genes and cells that might be involved. Maybe you didn't measure any of that in your study, but maybe here are, here are the potential mechanisms that explain what I'm seeing. Compare your results with other people's results. So this is where you get into dive into the literature and say what's out there already on this topic. How do you how do your results fit in? Do, are, are they confirming other results that are in the literature? If they're not confirming, if they're in contrast with other results in the literature, why do you think you're, you got different results? Um, so that's where you kind of put everything into that context of the wider literature. So that's right there, you've got a, the bulk of your discussion. Somewhere as you're getting towards the end of your discussion, you need to have at least one paragraph on strengths and limitations. And inevitably, we actually end up oftentimes spending a lot more time on limitations than we do on strengths. But do try to remember to highlight the strengths of your paper. Uh, you know, you're going to make a sale to your reader that, hey, here's all the good things about my paper. Put that in too. And, uh, and then you're going to give your limitations. And, and no matter what discipline in, you're in, you're going to have to have a, at least one paragraph on limitations. 
You want to explain why you think your results are robust despite some potential limitations uh, of your study. And all studies have limitations. Um, my main recommendation on the limitations paragraph is the mark of a good paper for me is when I'm looking through the rest of the paper before I get to the discussion section. I'm reading the results, looking at the tables and figures, and, I, and a question comes up in my head. I'm like, well, yeah, but see, this is the problem with your analysis. And I, and I think of these things as I'm going along. Something I'm going to criticize the authors on. Mark of a good paper for me is when I get down to that limitations paragraph in their discussion section, if they've anticipated my concern and they directly at least directly acknowledge it. Sometimes just having it acknowledged that they're aware of that is really important to me as a reader and a reviewer. Uh, and if, even better, if they tell me how they address that potential problem, that's great too. So that's really the mark of a good paper. A lot of times people write limitations section in a very generic way. Like, oh, well, my study was small and it had, you know, in other words, in a way that could apply to almost any study in that discipline. Don't write a generic limitation section. Really point out what matters, what limitations matter for your specific paper. Try to anticipate the reader's criticisms. You also want to spend a little bit of time saying what's next. Usually, again, that goes kind of towards the end of the discussion section. Well, some of these results need to be confirmed in future studies. Um, here are the unanswered questions. Here's the studies I can think of that come out of this study. That's really helpful to readers and other people in your field to figure out what studies need to happen next. So put that in. And then make sure that you also include in your discussion, again, this is probably going to be somewhere towards the end, the so what. Implicate, speculate, recommend. This is where you're saying, hey, why, why are these, why should anybody care about my findings? If you're doing something in the basic sciences, tie it to humans. What are the potential implications for people? Give it the big picture implications. Why are my results important? Why is the study important? Tell your readers why they should care. And this might mean you're moving, in this part, you, you, you can use the word speculate, you know, and that's okay. It's okay to speculate a little as long as you're telling your readers, hey, I'm, this is where I think we could go with this. Give that little bit of why it might be important. And then it's often nice in the discussion section to have one paragraph at the end where you have a very strong conclusion. Some, some journals will actually have a separate section for conclusion. But if they don't, just wrap up your discussion section by restating your main findings, the same finding that you opened your discussion section with, and give some kind of final take-home message for your readers. So some tips on the discussion section. Again, showcase your good writing. Use the active voice. Tell it as much as you can like a story. Start and end with the main findings. So the first sentence of your discussion section should be something like, it doesn't have to be exactly this, but it should be something like, we found that. And you answer the question that you asked. You answer your, the hypothesis. What, what did you find uh, relative to that hypothesis you were testing? And then you want to wrap up your discussion section again with some kind of conclusion where you restate that main finding. It's okay to repeat it because your reader will want to really, you know, really have it sink in what the main finding was. Be very, very careful in your discussion section that you don't travel too far from your data. Now, again, it's okay near the end to give some kind of speculation, big picture implication, how might this help humans. It's okay to step away from your data a little bit in, at the very end where you're very clear that this is the potential implications. But what I'm talking about is in your main findings, when you're talking about the main findings, your key finding and your, possibly your secondary findings, what you see happening a lot is uh, people will find one thing in their data, and yet when they go to the discussion, they'll tell you what they wanted to find, not what they actually found in their data. This is one of the reasons that I like to go and look at tables and figures first before I read anybody's discussion section, so that I can make a judgment about what I think they really found and what their data really support, as opposed to what they're hoping it supports. Uh, and there's always a temptation. There's something that we really want to prove, and uh, there's a temptation to even if your data don't show it, to just act like they showed it. So be very careful about that. One of the major problems that happens in discussion sections is that people will really reach way past their data. Sometimes this means also people will start discussing things that they don't have any data on. And so again, don't travel too far from your data. Stick to what you actually measured in your study. As I mentioned earlier, I talked about this already, you want to focus on the limitations that matter. Don't just stick in any generic limitations just because you know you have to have a limitations paragraph. If you can anticipate what the reader will uh, criticize in your paper, if you can anticipate that and, and 
beat them to the punch, you will impress a lot of readers and reviewers. Uh, again, that's the mark of a good paper for me. And finally, on the discussion section, make sure you're clear and consistent about your take-home message. I, again, I think this gets to that oftentimes the data, we want the data to show one thing, and they don't quite show what we want them to, and we still want to tell our readers that the data showed that. We still just believe in that hypothesis. So make sure that what that ends up happening is a little bit of waffling. So make sure that you're clear about your take-home message and that you're consistent and you don't kind of say, well, you know, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. Right. You, you've, got to, you've got to make it clear what you think your data actually say and be consistent about that. And don't start wandering again into what you wanted your data to say. So here's an example of a discussion section. So I have to start to introduce this discussion section. I'm going to start with the last part of the introduction section from this paper, because that's where they state the research question, what they were trying to do. So this was a study looking at uh, low-fat diets versus low-carb diets, a hot topic. So they said, we performed a study designed to test the hypothesis. Notice it's very easy for the reader to, in that introduction section to find what they were doing, because they actually said we wanted to test this hypothesis that severely obese subjects with a high prevalence of diabetes or the metabolic syndrome, so a specific group of people, would one, A, have a greater weight loss, and two, they would have a greater weight loss without any detrimental effects on their cardiovascular risk profile. So remember these uh, low-carb diets, you know, encourage you to eat a lot of steak and cheese, and they were worried, well, maybe, you know, your cholesterol is going to skyrocket, and even if you lose weight, and you're still going to be unhealthy. So those were their two aims that they were aiming for. So that was the end of their introduction section. So we get to the start of their discussion section. Starts. We found that severely obese subjects with a high prevalence of diabetes and the metabolic syndrome, that's the population they're studying, lost more weight in a six-month period on a carb-restricted diet than on a fat-restricted diet. So they answered question A. So they set up to see whether or not the low-carb diet would be better than the low-fat diet. And yes, uh, it was in terms of weight loss. So that answers question A. They give some mechanisms now. So the greater weight loss in that low-carb group suggests that maybe it's due to uh, overall caloric intake. So they had some more information, some more data that said, well, it's not, it's not that, they, that there's something magic about a low-carb diet. It's just simply that the diet is so restrictive and easy to follow that people actually do tend to do a better job at reducing their caloric intake. So there's nothing magic going on. It's just a diet that seems to be more successful for just because it reduces calories. So they give some mechanisms, some supporting information from their data. However, the explanation for this difference is not clear. Subjects in this group may have experienced greater satiety, so, so they're not sure why they ate less calories. Maybe uh, if you're able to eat meat, you feel more full, so therefore, you know, you eat less. Or maybe it's just has to do with the simplicity of the diet. So they're trying to give some possible reasons why they might have seen the result that they did. So possible mechanisms and unanswered questions. So they get a little bit into the supporting details within that first paragraph. And then they jump to the second paragraph, they answer that second question, which was the concern about if you eat a lot of steak and cheese, your cholesterol might skyrocket and you might have heart attacks. So they tell you, they answer that question. Subjects in the low-carb group actually had greater decreases in triglyceride, that's good, than subjects in the low-fat group. They had greater increases in insulin, insulin sensitivity, also, which is also good. Um, and um, there were no adverse effect on serum lipids, things like cholesterol. So that answers their second question. So it doesn't appear to have any bad effects in terms of cardiovascular risk. Now they're going to put that finding into uh, the, previa, the context of previous studies. So they go into some previous studies here. They did find something that was actually a little bit unexpected, that they thought that the reason the, the uh, low-carb group did better in terms of these heart parameters was simply because they lost more weight. If you lose weight, your heart health improves. However, even if they adjusted for the weight loss, it still seemed like there was even something better about the low-carb diet. So they had kind of an unexpected result. Um, yeah, and they gave some supporting, supporting details of that. So they're telling, putting everything in the context of previous studies, saying what was a little bit surprising. So that's our context. We get some more supporting details. So they're talking about their own data. Well, hey, we, we're, we think this finding is robust because it was consistent across different weight loss strata. Um, Here's, again, some more speculation about mechanisms. And then we start in on the limitations. 
So other uncontrolled variables or other unknown variables may have contributed to this effect. In addition, more precise, we didn't measure ins insulin sensitivity as precisely as we could have. So there were some limitations. There's some things we might want to do in a future study. Another, and then we're really jumping into the, the obligatory limitations paragraph here. So major limitation, a lot of our subjects were taking other drugs uh, in addition to doing this weight loss program and how did we control for that. So notice they try to tell you a little bit about how they tried to guard against this limitation having any major effect on their study. So they did another analysis that take, took that into account, didn't really change the results. So the fifth paragraph, now they give us strengths. So well, one of our strengths was we had, you know, a high proportion of black subjects in the group. Um, this is a group that's previously underrepresented in this type of study. Um, and they give some future directions. They say, well, other studies should look at different cultures and different ethnicities. They give another limitation. There's a high dropout rate. So weight loss studies, a lot of people don't finish them, and that might have affected our results. So this, this discussion section was seven paragraphs long, so here's the last paragraph. So notice that they restate in the last paragraph, they restate their conclusion, they restate their answers to the two questions they were asking. So that's okay, you actually want to recap. Taken together, our findings demonstrate that this population lost more weight during six months on a carb-restricted diet than on a low-fat diet. The carb-restricted diet actually led to greater improvements in insulin sensitivity, and again, that's a good thing. Uh, and that was, some of those improvements were independent of weight loss. And there was a greater, also a greater reduction in triglyceride levels, and it's good to get your triglycerides down. So they've just restated what they said in the opening two paragraphs, but you want to sum up what they found, the answer to those two main questions. And then they give you some big picture things, though. They say, well, hey, we got to interpret these findings with caution. This doesn't mean that everybody should rush out and go on a low-fat diet, because the magnitude of the over overall weight loss relative to how overweight these subjects were was actually pretty small. So they did lose more weight, but it wasn't a huge amount. There was a high dropout rate, so that, that makes it difficult to interpret the results of our study. So based on all that, they give a take-home message. So this is the take-home message that they're really giving to physicians. This study proves a principle and does not provide clinical guidance. Given the known benefits of fat restriction, future studies evaluating long-term cardiovascular outcomes are needed before we can endorse a low-fat diet. So they are giving kind of a take-home message. They don't want to overstate their findings, they're saying. There's still some questions to be answered, and we don't want to translate our findings yet into an actual clinical recommendation. All right, so one more um, example of a discussion section. So... Uh, Again, this uh, discussion section st starts by stating exactly what they did in the study, what they found. So in the present work, we give closed formulae. This was a, a mathematical study. It has a slightly different flair to it, but they're stating exactly what they did there. They aim to give closed formulae for this question, and they did it. We give closed formulae for the generating function of the cumulants of the current in the open TSAEP. They state a little bit about what's novel about their method. It's not... Um, a, um, an asymptotic, it's a, an exact method, and that's different than previous work. They put it in context with other studies. They put in a lot of context with other studies, other people who have tried to do similar things. Again, they point out what's novel. And then um, the one limitation that they point out, that the, the main limitation that was probably important for the study, is that they hadn't actually formally got a mathematical proof of the formula. It's only a conjecture, they say. So there's a limitation here, but they're going to defend their conclusion. They actually defend it pretty strongly. We have absolutely no doubt that our expressions are true. That's a really strong statement. Um, and there's, there's reasons for that. They, they have tried it in all dozens of cases uh, and derived it from all previously known results. They, they have all of these reasons why they're really sure that even though they haven't done the formal mathematical proof that they've nailed it. Um, this, uh, their findings, their method, uh, actually opens up some interesting, um, has some interesting implications and opens up some future directions. So furthermore, these final formulae allow us to draw some interesting physical consequences and to open new problems. So they're telling you, you know, hey, this is opening up a whole potential, um, you know, new set of interesting questions. They, again, repeat, and maybe this belongs in that last paragraph, but they, again, repeat the fact that this is only conjectures, um, and they haven't done that rigorous mathematical proof yet, but they do tell you that 
they don't think that that rigorous mathematical proof is anything other than a long computation. It doesn't have any, they've already captured the deep mathematical insight here. And they tell you they're presently working on that anyway, so that's a future study to give some other things that they're planning to do for future studies. So some more, a, a lot of what's next and future studies in this particular case. Their um, derivation opens up a lot of future studies. And uh, this, this uh, discussion was five paragraphs long, so here's the last paragraph. So finally, they're going to give some wider implications. So they solve the problem for a particular instance, what is TASEP. However, this, their solution might actually apply to the partially asymmetric case, PASEP. So there is a potential wider implication of their work. So they're giving those wider implications here. Um, and then they give kind of a big picture take on message at the very end. There must exist a general and hopefully elegant structure that encompasses all the cases, though we are well aware that such a structure may be difficult to discover. So they're saying there's this, this structure, there may be a structure that applies across all of these different cases, but it might be really difficult to discover. So they're kind of giving, you know, that's the take home message, how this fits into the bigger picture. So a few things of what not to do in your discussion section. So this was the beginning of a discussion section. It started with this meta-analysis is subject to a number of limitations. So do not start your discussion section with the limitations. Start with the we found that, the main finding that you found. The limitations, bury that deeper into the discussion section. That should be several paragraphs down. In terms of verb tense on the discussion section, well, first of all, your verb should be in the active voice for, for sure. And then Similar to the methods and results and introduction sections, you're going to use the past tense when you're referring to things that have already been completed. Those are study details, results, analyses, because you've already completed the analyses and, and other people's work. So we found that. Subjects may have experienced. Miller et al. found. But you're going to use the present tense when talking about what the data suggests, because the data are still suggesting that. The greater weight loss suggests. The explanation for this difference is not clear. Potential explanations include. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.